Welcome, welcome everyone. I guess I can start um, just for the people who haven't been with us before, just to say a few words about our group. Uh, our group is called Astronomy in Color. We are a group of black women and women of color, and we're working to try and make astronomy more inclusive. Our group started about one year ago, and we've created a strong and supportive community. And we, we really want to make astronomy a space where it, you know, everybody can thrive. And so for our inaugural speaker series, we were excited to hear from people who inspire us. Uh, we wanted to hear from incredible scientists who have really been working to change their fields and make a path for, for others. Uh, we wanted to hear about their work, their science, but we also wanted to hear about their journeys and advice from them and, share, and for them to share their journeys with all of you and also to get advice for what we can do to follow in their footsteps. Uh, we're very, very grateful to Vipisa who uh, sponsored this series um, for us. And uh, I think I'll probably start now by introducing our facilitators for today's talk. We have three, three facilitators. Uh, first is Dr. Nikita Madanpal. Uh, Nikita is originally from Peter Maritzburg. Um, she's a DARA Big Data Fellow and she's based at the IAU Office of Astronomy for Development in Cape Town. She develops projects for hackathons and implements hackathon events across Africa in order to aid data science skills development. She got her PhD in astronomy from the University of Western Cape and her research area is cosmology and extragalactic astronomy. She's also worked uh, a lot on RFI uh, as an RFI scientist at the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory. Next, we have Wanga Mulaudzi, who's originally from Johannesburg, South Africa. She started her career in astronomy at the University of Cape Town, majoring in astrophysics and physics for her undergraduate degree. And then she did her honors uh, with the National Astrophysics and Space Science Program, or NASP. And she worked on various projects in radio astronomy, instrumentation, and X-ray binaries. She is now a master's student at UCT, and her research involves testing the standard cosmological model using rotational velocities of galaxies in the MIT field. MIT is one of the large programs on Meerkat. And then finally, we have Shilpa Ranchod, who is from Cape Town uh, in South Africa. She completed her bachelor's at the University of Cape Town, and uh, also majoring in physics and astrophysics. Then she did her honors, her BSc honors, as part of NASP uh, as well, and just submitted her MSc thesis at the University of Pretoria. And her research was focusing on detecting distant, distant neutral H1 uh, with Meerkat through gravitational lensing and H1 spectral stacking as well as H1 in galaxy groups in the low redshift universe. Uh, she'll begin her PhD later this year. Okay, I will hand over to our moderators. Okay, thank you, uh, Prof Mohamed. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I now have the great pleasure and honor of introducing our speaker for today, someone who is indeed a trailblazer, uh, Jocelyn Valbanel. Jocelyn Balbanel inadvertently discovered pulsars as a graduate student in radio astronomy in Cambridge, opening up a new branch of astrophysics, work recognized by the award of a Nobel Prize to her supervisor. She has subsequently worked in many roles in many branches of astronomy, working part-time while raising a family. She is now a visiting academic in Oxford and the Chancellor of, uh, and the, Chancellor of the University of Dundee, Scotland. She has been president of the UK's Royal Astronomical Society, in 2008 became the first female president of the Institute of Physics for the UK and Ireland, and in 2014, the first female president of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. She was one of the small group of women scientists that set up the uh, Athena Swan scheme. She has received many honors, including a $3 million breakthrough prize in 2018. The public appreciation and understanding of science have always been important to her, and she's um, in much demand as a speaker and broadcaster. In her spare time, she gardens, listens to choral music, and is active in the Quakers. She has also co-edited an anthology of poetry with an astronomical theme, Dark Matter, Poems of Space. With that, I now ask that you give your full attention to uh, Professor Jocelyn Balvanel, over to you, Justin. Thank you very much, Nikita. Am I heard okay? Nobody's shouting at me, so yes, I think- that sounds good. 
<laughs> so good afternoon, everybody, or good morning or good evening if you are in other time zones. And thank you for the opportunity to be with you. What I'd like to talk about is a bit of biographical material, although the introduction has already been fairly full, I must say, um, a bit about the discovery of pulsars, about the role of women then and the role of women now, primarily in the UK, and how to survive, how to hang in there because I've had an unorthodox career and I've had to do quite a bit of hanging in there. So I hope what I have learned might be some use or some encouragement to some of you. So I've spent almost all my life in the British Isles. I started life in the north of Ireland. Um, at that time in Britain, in the, in the United Kingdom, Every child sat an exam at about age 11. It was believed that by age 11, you could tell whether a child was going to be academic and needed what we call grammar school education, or whether a more technical and practical education would be more appropriate for the child. Um, that, I would say, is no longer believed to be true, but it was believed then. Uh, the other factor in this story is that at age 11 or 12, girls tend to be brighter than boys, cleverer, because they're maturing a little bit faster. And one of the, quote, problems that there was with this exam at age 11 and a bit is that too many girls were passing the exam. Everybody knew, that's also in quotes, everybody knew that girls were only going to get married, be stay-at-home housewives, wives and mothers. And frankly, they didn't need a lot of secondary education. It was the boys that needed it. But too many girls were passing this exam and keeping boys out of the grammar school stream. So they set a higher pass mark for girls. And I actually failed that exam. So that was my first exam in life and I fail it. Um, it has always been my parents' intention that we would have some of our education out of Northern Ireland because it's very divided community, Protestant versus Catholics, sectarian, and they wanted us to have a more liberal education. So even though I had failed that exam, parents got me into what was called the grammar school stream for the next couple of years until I went away to boarding school in England. And that was great. Uh, you, know, you have different teachers, different subjects. You move around from classroom to classroom. Fantastic. And then on the Wednesday of the first week of term, there was a message to the first year class. This afternoon, boys to such and such a room and girls to a different room. And I thought, this is sport, Wednesday afternoon. That's why they're segregating us. It wasn't sport. They sent the boys to the science laboratory and the girls to the domestic science room, the cookery room, because everybody knew that we were only going to get married and be stay-at-home wives and mothers. And we needed to learn how to cook and mend clothes and make beds. And clearly it was going to take quite a few years to teach us that. I tried protesting, no effect. I told my parents and they got on the phone to the head teacher because I really wanted to do science and they promised me I'd get to do science. And next time the science class met, there were three girls and all the boys, myself, the daughter of the local doctor and her cousin. And the teacher I think had never taught girls before. He made us sit right at the front of the class up against his desk because clearly we were dynamite. We did physics that first term and I loved it. And without trying, I became top of the class in the exam. The thing I got wrong was the speed of light. We had a question, what's the speed of light? And I wrote it down in the old British units, you know, miles per second. 
And then for the first time in my life, I looked at that number and thought, that's very big, and changed miles per second to miles per hour and lost a couple of marks. Very good idea if you are a physics student to look at any answer you come up with and say, is that sensible? Just don't do it for the first time in an exam, folks. That's not so clever. So we did chemistry the next term. That was okay. We did what they called biology in the third term, which involved us being given flowers to draw, identify the different parts, label, and learn the names of those parts. And when you've done that flower, here's another flower. Draw the flower, label the parts, learn the names. And when you've done that, here's yet another flower. And I thought, this is boring, and had something of a prejudice against biology ever since. I duly went away to school uh, in the north of England at age 13. It was a boarding school uh, under the English education system from about age 15. You specialise just down to about three subjects. And I did maths, further maths and physics. And physics continued my best subject. And I decided I was going to do a physics degree at university. I had become interested in astronomy through reading my father's library books. For those of you who are astronomers, the library book that really got me interested was by Fred Hoyle, Frontiers of Astronomy. It's distinctly out of date now, but it was really very exciting. And I remember in physics classes in school, we were doing motion in a circle. And I'm reading in Fred Hoyer's book about the rotation of galaxies. And I can see the application of the physics we're learning in class to these huge galaxies. So I thought, right, I'll be an astronomer. And then somebody pointed out to me, I didn't think of this myself, that if you want to be an astronomer, you're working at night. You have to be good at staying up at night. And I knew I wasn't. I knew I needed my sleep. So I thought for a while, oh, I can't be an astronomer. And then I got to hear of astronomy opening up in other wavelengths, X-ray and radio, and decided I would be a radio astronomer. So before I had left school, I had decided I was going to be a radio astronomer. I did a physics degree in Glasgow because that seemed the best preparation. Uh, in the two honours years, I ended up the only female in a class of 50, 49 men and me. And it was the, quote, tradition that when a woman entered the lecture theatre there, all the guys would whistle, stamp, catcall, bang their desks, generally make as much noise as possible. And women students used to gather outside the lecture theatre and go in in a group. But because I was the only one, I had no group to go in with, so I faced this on my own. I learned not to blush, because if you blush, they only make more noise. Um, I've lost the technique now, but one can control one's blushing with a bit of practice. Um, and I mention that just in case any of you find yourself in a similar situation. And I was still interested in being a radio astronomer, so doing a PhD in radio astronomy was the next step. I would have preferred to go to Jodrell Bank, that was my first choice, but they didn't reply to my application and somebody had said they wouldn't take women. So I thought, this is the way they don't take women. Um, I've probably got to go to Australia to do this PhD because I'll never get into Cambridge. But the academic year in Australia begins in January or February. So I had a few months in hand. So I thought I'll put in an application to Cambridge just in case. And very much to my surprise, got a place. I, you, you may also have discovered this, those of you who are women, um, quite often greeted by people saying, are you sure you want to do physics? 
The men didn't seem to ask me that, but the women did regularly. Are you sure you want to do physics? And I quickly learned that it's women who are the custodians of what is proper for women. But if you're working in a male dominated area, it's the men who determine whether somebody, male or female, advances. So interesting situation. This is a lovely picture of <clears throat> the big radio telescope at Jodrell. It's just been made a World Heritage Site, so the university has to keep it standing, which doubtless will not be cheap, but uh, it, it's a wonderful thing. And where uh, radio astronomy started in the UK, indeed in most of the world, after the Second World War in the mid-1940s when people who had been doing research on radar took radar receiving equipment and turned it to the skies to see if they could pick up radio signals from anything in the sky. Actually, it was already known that the sun could be a radio source. The Japanese had experienced interference with their radar and had great trouble ascertaining what the source of this interference was. It was low in the east in the morning, high in the south in the middle of the day, and low in the west in the evening. And it is said they never worked out that it was the sun. So the sun, it was known, emitted radio waves. And when they started looking at the sky with radio wavelengths, they discovered a number of quite bright objects, which became known as quasars. Now, when I arrived in Cambridge, um, I was quite overawed. Um, everybody seemed very bright, very confident, and confident in their right to be at Cambridge University. And they, they all seemed to be Southern English and from you know, expensive schools. And here's I, female from the North and West of the country, out of my depth in many, many ways. And it wasn't helped when on the first day, we, the new radio astronomy graduate students, got given a set of tools. And this is my set of tools, I still have them. They're not microelectronics tools, these are full-size wireworking tools. Strong hint of what we are going to be doing. Now, one of the first things discovered by radio astronomers were some strong radio sources um, we now call them quasars, because when the radio astronomers got those things positioned, they said to the optical astronomers, what is there at that position? And the optical astronomers would say, well, there's something that looks a bit like a star, but it's, it's not exactly a star. And it was really a very strong radio source. So they became known as quasi-stellar radio sources, or quasars for short. At the time I'd started in radio astronomy, there were only about 20 quasars known. And this wasn't really a big enough sample. Um, my project was to find more quasars and ideally also get an estimate of their size. Quasars, because they are compact, uh, will fluctuate in brightness, will twinkle. It's called interplanetary scintillation. And to follow this rather rapid twinkling, you have to use a short time constant. If you use a short time constant, you make the signal to noise ratio bad. So you get around that by building a very, very large antenna so that you get lots of signal. And about half of a dozen of us spent the first two years building the radio telescope. I was spared most of the sledgehammering but by the end of my PhD, I could swing a 20 pound sledge. Not one of the normal skills, and it doesn't count towards your PhD. Uh, when telescope construction was finished after two years, it was my job as the first user to debug it, get it going, and spend six months using it to look for more quasars. And I found about 180 more quasars. This is a photograph taken um, fairly near the end of the construction. 
My particular responsibilities were all the cables and the connectors and the transformers and things like that. Um, some of the work had to be done outside. Um, there's a little red and white hut behind me. There's another one in the distance. Um, and I had cables that stretched from one hut to the other. And I sat in these little huts, putting, cable, putting plugs, connectors on those cables. And we ended up with an antennae working at 81.5 megahertz, which is a pretty low frequency by today's standards. 2000 antennae, lots of wooden posts, 120 miles of wire and cable, and an area of two and a half football pitches. And this is it. And it looks homemade because it is homemade. But probably for the first time in radio astronomy history, when I switched on that radio telescope, it worked first time. And I used this telescope for about six months. Um, I was then within six months of my funding finishing, so I stopped observing and got on with the data analysis and writing the thesis, handed the telescope over to another student. At that time, the University of Cambridge had one computer in the whole university. It had a memory comparable to your laptop, but it was made not with transistors and tubes, and it took up a whole room. And very few people had access to it, and my supervisor did not. So our data came out on paper charts, which were analyzed manually by the grad student. That won't surprise any of you, will it? Uh, it churned out a hundred foot of chart paper, 30 meters of chart paper every day. Um, every four days I completed a sky survey and started the game. So 120 meters per sky survey. And I ran it for six months. So I had over five kilometers of that paper. Now, imposter syndrome played a large part in this story. When I turned up in Cambridge, I felt, ha oh, they've made a mistake admitting me here. I'm not bright enough. They're going to discover that I'm not bright enough. They're going to throw me out. And my ploy was to work as hard as I could so that when they threw me out, I wouldn't have a guilty conscience. I'd know I'd done my best and I just wasn't good enough. So I was being incredibly thorough in analyzing these kilometers of chart paper. And I quickly identified the quasars, lots of them. And I in identified radio interference because a big radio telescope is very vulnerable to radio interference. But in addition to those, there was occasionally about five millimeters of signal on the chart that didn't look like interference and didn't look like a quasar. And you can see in this diagram, um, the quarter inch is labeled CP1919, and the interference is labeled interference. And with hindsight, this is the first sighting of the first pulsar. And if you compare that CP signal with the interference signal, you can see that they look different. See the interference signal, the pen goes up and down, whereas for the pulsar, as it turned out to be signal, the thing mainly goes upwards. And on the interference, you can see space between the spikes, whereas on some of the pulsar signal, at least, you can't see any space between the spikes. Incidentally, when you're making that kind of comparison, you are doing a Fourier analysis subconsciously. Uh, saying that the, there's space between the spikes or there is not space between the spikes is a comment on the frequencies that are present. With the lower frequency, there's space between the spikes. In saying spikes go up and down or spikes only go up, you're commenting on the amplitudes. And that's basically what Fourier analysis is, what amplitudes and what frequencies are present in this signal. Or more colloquially, does it look the same or do they look different? So I spotted this unusual signal. It wasn't always there, um, but 
when it was there, it was always at the same right ascension. So it was typically coming in at about half a centimeter in every 350 meters. Now it sounds amazing that your brain will notice that, but those of you who've trained as physicists may have the same, had the same experience as I have. There were inevitably bits of the physics course that I did not understand, at least at first. And those bits that I did not understand really bugged me. And the bug wouldn't go away until I took the time to sit down and understand that bit of physics. Well, at some subliminal level, this thing bugged me and stuck in my brain, which is how I managed to recall that I had seen something like this. And had I not seen it from the same right ascension? from the same, same declination or not. Well, you can get out all the previous chart records, you can spread them out on the floor and you can look see. And that's how I saw it came at the same right ascension and the same declination strip. Turned out to be what's now known as a pulsar, a pulsating radio star. Uh, these are now believed to be neutron stars, which are very, very compact, extremely dense, highly magnetized ones with the magnetic pole offset from the spin axis. And as it rotates, a beam of radio waves come out from the magnetic pole region. And as it rotates, that beam sweeps around the sky, a bit like a lighthouse. It also turns out that each pulsar has its own flash rate and its own pattern of flashes. So you, you get to know them as individuals, if you like. This was a totally unexpected discovery. It was a case of an unknown unknown. And I argue that it was imposter syndrome that led to it. You know, my fear that I was going to be thrown out and I was going to work my very hardest until they threw me out. And initially, it didn't have much effect on my career, but undoubtedly, it's helped me survive a rather atypical career pattern. My friends outside of astronomy were really very unimpressed. Uh, there was zero comment about having made a major astrophysical discovery. But I got engaged to be married between discovering pulsars number two and three. And the engagement ring and my engagement produced an enormous reaction from my friends outside. So I quickly got the message that society expected young women to get engaged to be married, did not expect them to make major astrophysical discoveries. I got married as I finished my PhD. Uh, my, I got married between submitting my thesis and having the viva and my husband worked in local government. And the way you advance in local government is by moving to another local authority and going up a notch in the process. So we moved to different parts of the country quite frequently. And this did not help me getting a job or keeping a job. Uh, we had a child, son was born four or five years after we married. And because Everybody knew, this is another everybody knew, because everybody knew that if mothers worked, the children would be delinquent. There weren't many childminding facilities because obviously they didn't want delinquent children. They expected mothers to be stay at home and not work. So that didn't help my career either. So my subsequent career, I liken to a game of snakes and ladders, the board game. I hope you're familiar with it. Um, you throw a dice and you work your way along these green lanes. And if you end up on a square with a ladder leading upwards, you may climb the ladder, and get ahead. But if you land on a square with the head of a snake, you have to slide down the snake and lose a lot of ground that you have gained. And to some extent, my career during my married life felt a bit like that. Um, we would arrive somewhere. I would contact the nearest astronomy place and say, might you have a part-time job? 
Uh, I could only work part-time because of child-minding issues. And they'd usually find a bit of money for me, a bit, you know, some little part-time job. And so I had a ladder to climb up. And I had usually great fun in that job. And then husband would say, it's time I move job. And I would move to the head of a snake and slide down it. And we'd go to another area and I'd have to find another ladder and repeat the process. So I did my PhD in radio astronomy. I then switched to the other end of the spectrum, the right-hand end in this diagram, worked in gamma ray astronomy. We then moved and I worked in X-ray astronomy. We then moved and I worked in infrared astronomy. Whoops, this side. And then I worked in millimeter wave astronomy. And then marriage broke up and the kid went off to university. And suddenly I was free to work in whatever I wanted to. But I have to say I was fairly lucky. The actual jobs I held were not prestigious. Um, but for instance, I landed in X-ray astronomy, running a satellite for a lab, the Ariel 5 satellite for the Mullard Space Science Lab. And that satellite discovered so many things about the X-ray sky. It was phenomenal. Um, and then when I moved to millimeter wave astronomy, I was helping commission the new James Clark Maxwell telescope on Mauna Kea, which was the millimeter wave band opening up. So there's been a lot of excitement and a lot of fun, even if my CV does not look good. I've had a job as a researcher, as a university lecturer, as a tutor, manager, a professor, a head of department, a dean, PR, and an outreach person. Um, in a sense, since I retired in my 70s, um, my career has become much more coherent. <laughs> But uh, I've had a wealth of experience, lots of colleagues, knowledge of a lot of fields, and a lot of fun. Now, one of the things that happened um, shortly after we had moved somewhere, and I was saying to a new neighbor, um, I was hoping to get a job. And she turned on me and she said, you've got a husband, a new baby, and a new house, and you say you're bored. What's wrong with you? A little sharp, indeed. I think part of what was going on was this. She was actually a very intelligent woman. She could have held down a very good job. I suspect she had rather drifted into marriage and motherhood and hadn't really thought about whether she ought to have a career. And I come along and am unconsciously challenging assumptions she doesn't even know she's made. It's certainly the case that, in, for my age group, that previous generations of women did not expect to have careers outside the house. Subsequent generations do. My generation has been rather at the turning point. So I did postdocs in Southampton University, uh, so I did gamma ray astronomy. I was a research fellow and then that money ran out. I became a teaching fellow, which is like half a lecturer with the full lecturer's teaching load. But it was a good place to begin your undergraduate lecturing career. Then moved to Mullard Space Science Laboratory, which is a X-ray astronomy lab. I was working part time there initially as a programmer on the technical staff. Um, then they got a bit embarrassed that I was on the technical staff and managed to find me an associate research fellow post. And then we moved and I went to the Royal Observatory Edinburgh, still working part time, initially as a research fellow and then into management positions. Running the visitor centre, running the James part of the James Clark Maxwell Telescope Organisation. Um, the marriage broke up, it perhaps won't surprise you, at about the time the child, the baby, went off to university to do a physics degree, which might not surprise you. And I got, for the first time, a job of my choice. I became Professor of Physics and Chair of the Physics Department at the Open University in Milton Keynes. And this was a full-time job, and while there I earned a sabbatical year, I think it was, 
and actually spent 18 months in Princeton University in the United States. Uh, I ended up at the University of Bath as Dean of Science, running about a third of the university. Um, that was definitely a management role. On a good day, I only had three or four meetings. On a bad day, I had seven or eight meetings. It was interesting work, but I was getting a lot of invitations to go places and speak and realized I couldn't do that while I was Dean. So I took slightly early retirement and have been doing all sorts of fun things since then. How to survive. Some of you I fear may have a spell between jobs. Um, keep up your networks, keep in touch with your professional body, try and have a work address. Could you be a visiting, a visitor at your present place? ask for a visiting position. There are lots of wonderful data banks, so you can do quite a bit of your own research if you plunder them. You can be a referee for journals, you can referee for research councils, you could be a journal editor possibly, or some sort of assistant or dog's body. You can serve on professional body and research council committees. It's not all research, but it keeps you in contact with the field and keeps your profile up. Um, does a local educational place need tutors? I don't know if there are senior projects in schools or even universities which you could supervise. Would you examine project reports? Um, but above all, um, recognize what skills you're acquiring and put them on your CV. And even if you become a stay at home housewife, um, if you've got a mortgage, you're managing a large budget, put it on your CV. And if you can persuade your kid to do what you want it to do, your toddler, you can certainly manage anybody. You also gain experience of multitasking and time management, um, interpersonal skills, planning skills. Put them on your CV. Um, you're going to have to take risks, embrace risks, surprise yourself. Remember that one failure does not make a disaster. Einstein was a failure to begin with. Be persistent, hang in there, aim as high as you can and try and keep your options open. And Africa is a good place to be at the moment. It's widely recognized that the next Einstein will be African. And I'm aware of a number of developments in astronomy and space, which I'm listing here, um, and mathematical physics. There's probably similar things for other subjects, I just, I'm not aware of them. But in radio astronomy, there's the Square Kilometre Array building in South Africa. Um, there's Meerkat, that's the precursor for that. Um, there are a network of smaller dishes over, I think it's 11 African countries uh, under the heading of DARA, development in Africa with radio astronomy. Um, for maths and mathematical physics, there's AIMS, the African Institute for Mathematical Studies. That's in Cameroon, Ghana, Senegal, South Africa, Tanzania. Um, and there is also a Space in Africa website, which includes uh, commercial activities as well as academic ones. So there's a lot happening in, in my area. I would imagine there is in other areas. Um, it's getting better all the time, although I think probably everybody will agree it had to start from rather behind some of the bits of the world. But it's rapidly developing. And so you are the right age range to take advantage of this. And I hope it will work out well for you. Thank you for your attention. And I leave you with this, my favorite quote, from a Harvard professor. Well-behaved women rarely make history. So go for it, ladies. Don't be well-behaved. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, um, Jocelyn, uh, for the amazing talk and for sharing your, your journey uh, and your experiences with us. There's so many lessons that we can all take um, from your journey and, and thanks for all the amazing advice as well. Um, just a reminder to everyone who has questions to please enter them into the chat.
and uh, I'll now hand over to Wanga. Thank you. Thanks again, Dawson. It was a really motivating talk. I can personally say that I learned a lot, especially considering that you did work in instrumentation where there aren't really a lot of women representatives there. Um, so now I will move on to ask uh, some questions that were submitted by the participants um, when they're registered. And the first question is, um, how much bias, if there is any, is subjected to people applying for permanent positions in the West based on ethnicity in various astronomical fields? And if you can perhaps also comment on astronomical instrumentation in particular. I can't say a huge amount about astronomical instrumentation because it's a long time since I've worked in that. Um, but speaking more generally, certainly in British universities now, there is a lot of attention paid to when you have a job, job advertised. Um, what's the balance of genders with the applicants? Uh, are you calling to interview um, men and women? Take care not to call just men. And the interview panel itself, does it have men and women? So in Britain at least, and I think increasingly in other similar countries, I can think of Ireland, Australia, Canada, and the USA, there is a lot of attention given to the balance um, of gender and race and disability and all the other protected characteristics uh, amongst the staff of a department, the students of a department in recruitment and so on. So the world's changing quite fast in that respect. It's beginning to pay a lot of, of attention to these issues. Thank you for that. And the next question is, uh, what are your thoughts on the removal of statues, renaming buildings, etc., of divisive historical figures, figures such as Cecile Rhodes, whose statue has now been removed from UCT and Oriel College at, College at Oxford? Yeah, I'm not sure that I've come to a conclusion about statues of past people, what to do about that. You cannot rewrite your history, um, but you need to recognize what your history actually was. Um, and I think what's even more important is looking ahead and making sure you don't make the same mistakes. You, society, does not make the same mistakes again. And the last question I will ask is, given that the majority of astronomers and even more broadly scientists in STEM are male. We were somewhat dismayed that they make up only 25% of our registered participants for the series. Do you have any advice on how to engage with allies, how to convince them that they really need to be a part of the solution? Yeah. Um... The big change came in Britain when funding bodies required departments to, this physics department that I'm thinking of, required physics departments to monitor the fraction of its staff and students that were female and to report how they were improving. And when a funding body begins to ask that kind of question, departments sit up and take notice. And that's what's produced the big change in Britain. So trying to get something similar in your country is probably going to be the best in the long run. The way it happened in Britain was there was a small group of senior women, I was one of them, wondering how we could improve the number of women in physics departments, science departments. And we came up with the idea of a prize for the most woman-friendly department, or no, I think most woman-friendly university. And vice chancellors like competitions, so they competed. And then one of the funding bodies suddenly said, um, you need to hold one of those awards before you can apply for our funding. 
And that really made the community sit up. So that was how it happened in Britain. And then having other countries having seen what was happening in Britain started copying it. Thank you for that. And for again, I'd like to thank you for the wonderful talk that you have given us. I will now hand over to Shopa, who will ask the questions from the chat. Thanks, Wanga, and thank you, Jocelyn, for such a motivational and inspirational talk. Um, we have quite a few questions in the in the chat, so I'll just get started with that. Um, there's a question from Denisha. Thank you for the inspiring and insightful talk. Do you have any further advice um, to overcome imposter syndrome? Not a lot of work being done on imposter syndrome, I think, although it is becoming more recognized. I think the strategy that I devised is the best I can recommend, which is to say to yourself, well, perhaps they have made a mistake admitting me. Perhaps they will throw me out, they'll discover their mistake. But until they do, I'm going to work my very hardest so that when they throw me out, I won't feel guilty. I'll know I've made the best I could of the opportunity. And if you work that hard, then probably won't throw you out. Thanks. Um, right, the next question is from Rajika, who says, have you ever worried about not having the drive to stay in astronomy, given some of the societal pressure you are experiencing? The societal pressures actually might well have applied wherever I was working. So I think the question really is, um, wouldn't I just like to be a housewife, mother, wife, housewife, mother? Um, and I knew I would go mad if I didn't have some intellectual activity of some sort. And that's probably going to be the place, the situation for everybody today on this call. Um, we've all of us got brains. And I think just being a housewife and, you know, doing the dusting and running the laundry um, probably won't keep us sufficiently occupied. I think we're going to want to do something as well. And then the question is, what can you do? Can you get a job you like? Well, thank you for that. Um, we have a question from Mamta. Uh, what is your advice to institutes and funding agencies on mothers who face discrimination all over their career as you yourself experienced? Um, one thing that's beginning to happen more is that fathers are also expected to help with childcare. So um, I worked part-time for much of my life. Um, it's now the situation that men in Britain are also allowed to work part-time or take a, a chunk of leave when a baby is born, for example. So that helps. Um, but I realise that that's quite a big step to take um, and probably not every country is ready to do that yet. If I can sure, not every country is ready to do that yet. But having the men share domestic responsibilities and in particular childcare responsibilities, I think is very important. Uh, without that, the women will be at a disadvantage forever. Yes, I suppose you, you just have to make sure you find a partner that's that's willing to share that responsibility. Yes, and an employer who will allow your partner to take leave, etc. Um, I have a question from Lynn, um, who says, thank you so much for this talk. I particularly appreciated that you opened with the mention of failing an exam. That kind of transparency is inspirational and motivational. I have a 13 year old niece who wants to be a scientist, but is already afraid that she's not good at maths. Um, do you have any words of encouragement for her or for young people in the same position more generally? Yeah. Um, girls in mixed schooling um, are at quite an early age going to 
feel inferior because the boys are encouraged to be um, outgoing, positive, brash, confident, leading. Uh, and you can quite often find, you know, in a science experiment, the girl is taking notes, writing down the data, and the boy is doing the experiment. And it's that uh, traditional kind of role play that we need to be aware of um, and encourage them to reverse roles every so often so they both get practice at doing both. Um, but there's a lot of societal pressure still on girls to be nice, um, domesticated, pretty, tame, whereas the boys can be outgoing and adventurous and have more fun quite often. I don't know if it's the case in your country, but in our country, toy shops are often quite segregated. There's a blue section for the boys and a pink section for the girls. And the pink section is all passive stuff. Um, little cookers, little tea sets, bed making, nursing. Whereas the boys is construction kits and flying kites and doing adventurous things. Um, in Britain, our children are gendered very, very early. And I don't know what it is in all your countries, but it's something that's worth looking out for. Because as long as the girls are encouraged to be passive and servant-like, those few girls who want to do something different uh, are going to feel a bit isolated. Thank you. Um, we have your, quite a lot of questions here, so I think we'll probably take about three more. Um, from Nadir, uh, thank you very much for the, for the inspiring talk. It's amazing how discovery of pulsars was made by analysis of the kilometers of printouts. Nowadays, data analysis is heavily dependent on advanced techniques, including artificial intelligence. What do mm -hmm. you feel about this? And what is the risk of missing out some important details in our massive data? Yes, that's a wonderful question. And I think it will become particularly acute when we get the Rubin telescope going. This is the one in Chile, an eight point something meter telescope. It's going to be looking for transient events. And the numbers vary, but I've seen one million alerts per night, up to 10 million alerts per night. Alerts being, oh, something's flaring or something's moving or you know, something's changed. And no way can human beings, no way even can hundreds of grad students handle that amount of data. It's got to be computerized. And the snag is, if you're not very careful, you program the computer to look for things you already know about. And the things that you don't know exist, don't get picked up because you haven't told the computer to look for them. So you could actually do with some human beings screening the stuff that the computer says is rubbish. Um, it, it's a very interesting problem and I don't know actually how you fully get round it. I think it, we would be wise for quite a long time to recognize that the way computers do our data analysis for us probably means they're missing some significant segments of things. Um, thank you for that. That was quite an insightful answer. Yeah, I think there definitely will be a lot of work to be done um, when these huge projects, as well as the, the SKA, um, come online. Um, question from Angela. Um, another side of the imposter syndrome coin is that young scientists faced with young scientists face today is being seen as getting ahead in our careers just because of diversity and inclusion initiatives. And it seems to me that no matter how hard we work, it's so easy to overlook and boil it down to she wouldn't be here if it wasn't for these initiatives. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any advice on battling that view within ourselves and our institutions? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And I'm sure the questioner is absolutely right that that's going to happen a bit. Um, I think having courage um, is going to be one very important attribute, you know, when you face that kind of discrimination. 
or that kind of, um, well, it is discrimination, yes. Um, but there, as long as there is sufficient competition for, from the, the minority groups, then the people from the minority groups who get places will be equally intelligent as those from the majority groups. So I think the best thing you can say is, you know, look, mate, I've got these school qualifications. I got a first class degree or whatever, you know, from a prestigious university. Um, I'm better qualified than you are possibly. <laughs> but it's going to need a certain amount of strength and courage and robustness, I do accept, um, until the situation is more redressed and the balance is better. Um, yeah, certainly. I think one of the main points that you have been driving is courage. Um, and I think that's what's so great about this, this group and having these talks, just really, we can all affirm each other um, to build up each other's courage. Um, Okay, second last question. So um, this is from Aishwarya. Um, Hi, Jocelyn, really encouraging talk. Thank you very much. My question is, since academics is a very mobile career, any advice on how one can manage the personal life with all the moving required for a professional life? Yes, it is difficult to, to organize. Um, I would say find yourself a big city with several universities, several research institutes that will maximize the chances of both of you getting good jobs and still being able to live together. Um, that's probably the, the best way around it. Um, the only other thing is to marry somebody who works from home, you know, a writer, an author or something like that. <laughs> but yeah, it's a real headache. It's, it's an enormous problem. Um, if there has to be compromise, I think it's right that maybe you take turns to compromise, that it's not always the wife who does the compromising. Yeah, thanks. Um, this will be our last question and it's from Astronomy in Colour. Um, may you please tell us about the Balbanel Scholarship and what qualities you are looking for for applicants? Right, thank you for that. Um, I got given I think it was three million dollars as a prize, a ridiculously large sum of money, and I gave it to our Institute of Physics to set up uh, funding for PhD students from people who were from underrepresented groups in physics. And in Britain, the underrepresented groups in physics are women, people of color, uh, probably people with disabilities, people from poor backgrounds who haven't had the best school education, refugees, people like that. Um, when you make a donation like that, I think it's important that you then stand back. So I have not been involved in the selecting people to receive the awards, but it's done by the Institute of Physics. And they have awarded four people PhD studentships that started at the beginning of this academic year. It so happens they are all women. Two of them are not originally British. They came to Britain a few years ago um, for various reasons. Uh, one is a woman with a baby who is, needs extra support to keep going. You know, she's a PhD student. Uh, and the fourth one is from a very, very poor city area who did not get a very good school leaving mark in physics, but did a physics undergraduate degree, did extremely well, and is now doing a PhD in an area of physics. So that's really encouraging. And uh, I guess it's going to go on with that sort of level of the number of studentships each year. But of course, they might not all be women. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to recognize that people from different backgrounds can often bring a different way of thinking about a problem. When you're working in a research environment, having somebody who thinks a bit out of the box or has a different box to you is really, really helpful. And that's why I was keen to fund people from underrepresented groups. 
Okay, thank you. Um, that sounds like an amazing initiative. I'm sure we can encourage a lot of the, um, the undergrad students here to apply for that. Um, and yes, uh, thanks again for such a, a wonderful talk and also some really, really great answers. And now I'll um, hand back to Shazreen to close. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Shilpa. And thank you so, so much, Jocelyn. It was an amazing to have you. I should say personally that I'm very lucky to have had you as a, a role model during my PhD, and I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't have you trailblazing the way. And I'm sure um, from your talk that our, you know, we have a lot of students who are working on radio astronomy, and I think that they're probably all really, really happy that they don't have to go out and build their own, <laughs> their own telescopes themselves uh, to do that. So just, I mean, hearing how far things have come and your contribution to really making those changes, I think is really, really incredible. Thank you so, so much for that. Um, I will, I'll put this the video, we'll, we'll send it out online so people can watch it and share it. And I'll send you also some of the questions in the chat if you have time, um, you could have a look at those. Um, but thank you so much. If, if everyone wants to put on their video just to say hello and uh, you can see all of the people who've been listening in and uh, and taking part. Um, I'll move that to the side and everybody can wave and say hello. But thank you so much. I know that you're also really super busy. And so we're very, very grateful for your time um, for sharing your story and, uh, and your journey. Thank you very much, everybody. And best wishes. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone for joining. I should take some screenshots. I always do, uh, and I'll send you some screenshots of this too. <laughs> I always take too many in the end, but uh, <laughs> thanks everyone. Our next uh, talk is uh, on the 28th and we'll have uh, Professor Chanda prescott Winstein joining us um, for that. But we hope that, uh, I'll, I'll hopefully send these, these videos out uh, and the previous ones in a, in a few weeks time. But thank you all so, so much for joining us. Happy new year. and. Uh, Yes, hopefully a better 2021. And thank you so much for Justin for, uh, for starting us off and kicking us off on such a great note. Thank you very much, Shazri. Um, good luck to everybody. Thanks.